And we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to our final class of this year's MIT Computational Law Report. Um, I just wanted to personally thank all of you for showing up these last few weeks. When this course started, our intention was to introduce all of you to computational law and give you some tools to start exploring ideas at the intersection of law, technology, business, and society. And I truly feel like these goals have been met. When I think back to everything from our conversations regarding legal syntax to discussions about legal frontiers that are being braved by regulators in Wyoming, I'm not only impressed by the knowledge of our incredible speakers that we've had the honor of listening to in my, um, over the last four weeks, but I'm also equally impressed by the level of engagement and thoughtful questions you all brought to the table. Your contributions have planted seeds of ideas that I know I'll personally be, be thinking about and iterating on for a long time. And I just wanna say again that it was such a pleasure sharing this experience with all of you. So now I'm gonna pass over to Daza who has a couple of things to say as well. Thank you so much TMA. And thank you for being um, such a terrific um, anchor host uh, for, for, the, for the entire, um, I guess I'd call it for every episode of this season of our show <laughs> or for the classic. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. So, uh, and like TMA, I also want to share my heartfelt um, admiration for the level of game that everybody's brought this year. Um, it's really been, uh, I think we've learned as much from you as, as we've all learned from the speakers. And uh, we're just terribly grateful uh, for your level of attention and for your contributions. And um, I may have a few more remarks along those lines to say at the end, but I don't wanna cheat us from these amazing speakers. Uh, and, and also there's some other remarks that um, I hope that, uh, that, that we'll wanna hear from, uh, from the uh, co-presenters. Uh, just one, one um, I guess I'd say, kind of program note is that we're going, I'm gonna put this at the top of the hour rather than the end. Um, we're going to launch a monthly computational law community building call. Um, it will be similar-ish to what we do during office hours. And we thought the office hours worked incredibly well with this group of people um, where it was a little bit more, more discussion and we're going to pair it with flash talks. So they'll be like incredibly tight, like two ish minute talks on point, just like the three talks that we heard over the last month. And then we'll have an opportunity for discussion and a little bit of intro and outro. So if you're in this class, or if you have ever presented to this class or about to present to this class, you can expect an invitation to those. And they'll be the last Friday of each month from 12 to one during the same period of time. And uh, we'll see how that goes. So this will be sort of the MIT take on on a monthly call uh, in this in this case in the area of computational law. So with that, um, I'd like to um, hand it to Brian Wilson, who um, has some remarks, and in particular is going to just do a little bit more depth on uh, for those of you who have elected to do a class project. And then Brian, perhaps you can hand it forward so we can come to the speakers and I'll do the intros for the speakers. Thank you. Sure. And so building on what Daza said and what TMA said, uh, you know, I think we're all really, really grateful for everything that we've been able to do in this course period. Um, when we started the publication of the computational law report a few years ago, we wanted to create a really strong anchor of convening experts holding conversations about topics in the space and producing content. And I think with this course, that has been something that we've been able to achieve. And in the, in the real spirit of MIT and durable learning and building and creating and iterating, um, we're really excited to see the final projects that everybody who is decided to submit one, um, what they'll submit um, over the next couple of days. And so to just briefly recap, uh, for project submissions, you'll submit a quad chart and a, either a prototype, a paper, or a pitch deck. And with the quad chart, we really wanted to drive home that these are very pithy ways to organize your thoughts in a, in a, in a strong and cohesive anchor. Um, so you've all seen these uh, kind of descriptions before, and you've seen 
you know, the way that this plays out. But what you haven't seen and what, something that we're really excited about is the ability to organize the, the submissions using the quad charts. So we'll be able to put everybody's slide that they're submitting for the quad chart in a comprehensive slide deck so that we can embed that slide deck in the course site itself so that whenever anybody goes to see what projects people have done in the past, they can scroll through your pro project and see you know, what you did and how you learned about it. And we think that type of learning is going to be incredibly valuable for the way that we move the field forward and move the move toward the computational law future that I think everybody is so excited about. And so with that, um, I'm going to go out of screen share and hand it over to Andrew for a few remarks um, as well. Sure, thanks, Brian. I just wanted to say thank you to all the speakers, uh, my fellow team members, and especially the participants in this course. We've had excellent discussions about a variety of thought-provoking topics, and we all really appreciate your interest in and your contributions to this course. Computational law is a very exciting discipline with important implications for how society incorporates major technological advancements. My belief is that this discipline will grow and I'm encouraged by the significant response we've had to this course. The early community of computational law, which I would say everyone on this call is part of, makes me optimistic that we can address the novel questions and challenges ahead. So thank you, and I'll pass this to Megan. Hi everyone. So um, echoing sort of the sentiments of both, um, of kind of the entire team, as well as thanking kind of the guest speakers that we had, um, this has been really, really inspiring. Um, as I mentioned very early on, I was part of an earlier generation, well, not generation, I guess just last year, um, of this course. And I think that the sort of the rigor that you brought to this year's just knocked kind of my years out of the park completely. And I think all this is very inspiring and encouraging as Andrew and Tammy were all saying in how this sort of area is growing and how you know we're heading towards a sort of very um, beautiful future with computational law. So I, with that, I think I will hand it back to Daza. I don't wanna take up any more time. So yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Okay, now let's get into the main course. Um, today, we're going to space. <laughs> and uh, and uh, what we're going to do is discuss current and emerging trends in law and dispute resolution involving space and the moon and orbit and all sorts of stuff once we get you know off the earth. Uh, and so we're going to ask whether or how, I think mostly how, computational law could help to meet these the growing challenges uh, that, that are raised by our, well, increasingly inhabiting space as a people. And so we have two amazing speakers. First, um, Viva, who is a legal hacking leader uh, who, uh, who we know from her uh, work in New York legal hackers and who has gained some real expertise uh, based on her um, work at McGill in, um, in Canada and also as an attorney at King and Spalding in this um, somewhat niche, but really we think essential area of arbitration of space-based disputes. And so with that, I, I'd like to hand the microphone off to Viva. And, um, and, uh, and uh, I, I think you should be able to advance uh, your slides and uh, we've sent you the deck. And, but let me know if you have any issue or if you'd like us to do the slides for you. Could you please do the slides? I could just do next slide. Yeah, I could. Or should I be doing a, a, just a screen share? I guess those are the two options. I think either way, I, I've got it queued up or we can hand it over. Probably it's best if you do it, Viva, because okay. um, you've got a lot of slides and you just kind of select a few to talk over. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Just give me a second here. Where's Chris? So at least one of the students has a special custom background for today. I don't know if I see him. Oh, he's not here yet. Okay. We'll be on the lookout for Chris. Um, he's coming from Space Command today. Ah, good, here we go. All right, Viva. 
So I'm just making sure it's in present mode. Is everyone, are we able to see stuff? It looks good. Awesome, great. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Daza, for the warm, warm welcome. Uh, it's my first time um, attending this class. Um, and as Daza mentioned, I am a trial and global disputes lawyer at King and Spalding and one of the organizers um, for legal hackers in New York. Um, I have an interest both in space law, um, space and law, and I've combined that interest um, in thinking specifically about space disputes. And so I'm here today to discuss current and emerging trends in, in, in space law, as well as space related disputes. And, and as Daza mentioned, pose some questions on the fields of computational law and how that field might help advance space law itself. Um, so before I begin, I guess, I will make a disclaimer, um, which is just that I'm here in my capacity as a student. Um, I'm here to you know, learn about systems design um, and thinking and the views that I express are solely my own. Um, they're not legal advice, and I'm here to learn and share with you the same way you're here to learn and share with me. Um, so with that, we're going to get started and discuss specifically um, <clears throat> what, what my presentation will be about, um, which is a quick and dirty table of contents on why space matters, um, why I believe we should be analyzing space disputes, the status of current space-related disputes, um, what we might imagine future space-related disputes to look like, as well as the role of computational law in the resolution of future space disputes. So um, why are we talking about space in this course? Um, and why should we talk about disputes in particular? Uh, I believe there's three different reasons. Um, first, space has a growing number of actors, a growing number of stakeholders. And what was once an industry that was dominated by a few states um, has now opened up to other states and to the private sector. Um, in just over 10 years, more than 20 countries have started investing in space programs. Um, they're, they're proposing their own private endeavors, their own projects in space. Just last year, India and Israel um, tried to launch tried to land a probe on the moon. Um, space activities in Africa have picked up significantly. Um, the, co the continent has, I think, more than 14 space agencies alone. Um, a number of countries are launching satellites into space, which was unheard of until a long time. Um, and we're, because of that growth, we're also seeing an increase in private actors, non-state actors, um, primarily in the satellite industry. The other reason why this, the growth of these actors is important is, is that the, the space sector is, is seeing a new cycle um, of development um, and older and more technologies are making way for new actors and new commercial downstream activities, right? Um, that come from primarily the satellite industry uh, signals and data. Um, and as would be expected, that is leading to new economic opportunities, new assets. Um, last year, the space industry stood at $350 billion. Um, it's expected to grow to a trillion, more than a trillion, um, which isn't small amounts of money. And these are numbers, I mean, right, there is a big hype about space as well, so we should take that into consideration. But um, the best is yet to come, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, and the, and the industry is growing. Um, of course, the pandemic this year uh, will have an effect on the industry, uh, as every industry has been affected. Um, so I guess we'll see how that affects some of these new actors. Um, but just to say that it is a growing industry with, with increased assets as well. Um, in terms of the law and policy, I think that that's, that's the interesting part. That's why we're here. Um, it's been described, space has been described as the wild, wild west. And, and you know, I think for, for a while, perhaps it was, perhaps it still may be because it was the unknown. Um, and now I think the industry is maturing or it's growing, it's emerging, sorry, it's not maturing yet. Um, 
the five outer space treaties, there are five UN space treaties which were negotiated in the 60s and till the 80s during the Cold War. Um, those have principles, those are mostly focused on space actors. Um, those treaties are going to stay, they will probably be renegotiated, we'll see what happens, what countries do. But last year, what's more interesting for me is um, America, the United States launched um, the Artemis program and which brought with it the Artemis Accords, uh, which is to me very exciting as someone who used to in the past work in the government of Canada as well. Uh, that program promotes principles like the peaceful use of space and opens up the, up the field formally to, to new actors, to new, new space actors. And the principles are, you know, focus on transparency. They focus on peaceful use of space, emergency assistance, um, space exploration and the use of space resources. So these are things that the past treaties never talked about. And so a new field is emerging where new regulations, new policies will start being negotiated, will start, um, start being discussed, um, which will determine our path going forward for this growing industry. Uh, so the Artemis Accords, I would also mention, were signed um, last year. Uh, a number of countries, I think it's around eight, um, including the UK, including Canada, a number of spacefaring nations, but also other countries um, are part of the Accords. Um, there's been some disagreement. They are controversial. A number of other countries don't like the Accords because um, they, they shift the move movement away from the UN system that currently exists. But nonetheless, uh, I think they're a game changer. Um, and additionally, we're also seeing movement on domestic fronts where uh, countries are establishing regulatory regimes for property rights um, for, for their, for their uh, companies, which is also really interesting. And so particularly, I would note the United States, Luxembourg, the UAE, we'll see if that list grows in the future, but um, I think it's an interesting start. So this is just a slide to share a little bit background on the space, you know, space economy. Um, I won't spend too much time on it given, given that we're here for a short period, but I just wanted to put it up there in case anyone would like to look into um, what the space economy entails, at least, at least pursuant to the OECD. I see that this, the formatting has messed up at the bottom there, so I apologize about that. Um, so why analyze space disputes? I think um, that in any economy, uh, this is not, I don't think this is brain science, but you know, conflict avoidance is important, but disputes will come up. Um, what can we learn from these disputes? I think that that's the part that going forward, as we, as we think about this growing economy, as you think about these emerging laws, um, how might we design disputes, resolution systems to ensure effective dispute resolution when these disputes do occur? How might we track the development of space law and promote the rule of law in outer space? Um, and how might we generate a legal infrastructure that provides predictability and certainty to space actors, right? It's, it, space is inherently risky, at least right now. Um, and so you do need predictability and certainty uh, for investors to invest, for countries to know what they're signing up for. So these are the three reasons why I think looking at disputes is incredibly important. Um, and it's important to keep this in mind, I think, especially from a computational law angle as well, because I think, I, I mean, I, I would argue that each of these three reasons have a link to computational law. Um, and, and I'm excited to discuss some of those angles uh, later today. So moving quickly to uh, the current status of space-related disputes. Um, I think there are three trends. This is what I've been able to find in my research. Disputes are resolved amicably, um, which means they're not going always to courts uh, or uh, you know, being written up. They're usually behind closed doors and they focus primarily on state, state actors. This is what we found before we started our research. Um, and we weren't, you know, the question was, what are commercial parties doing? Um, and so I'll, I'll touch on very br uh, briefly on commercial parties, but before I do that, I'll just share two examples, two quick examples of um, disputes involving state actors, just so you have an idea of what has happened in the past. 
Um, the first example is the USSR uh, had a nuclear powered satellite, um, which crashed in the 70s, late 70s, um, and created a bit of a frenzy, of course, right? It's during the Cold War. Uh, America notified Canada of, of this happening and um, people had to go out and clean up the mess in Canada, this was in the territory of Canada. Um, ultimately, Canada filed, it wasn't a formal claim, it was a, a I should have actually put up the papers on it, but they requested uh, reimbursement for the cleanup. Um, and it was pursuant to the Liability Convention, which is one of the UN treaties, one of the five treaties. Um, ultimately, they didn't end up using the dispute resolution mechanism. It, the dispute was resolved amicably, um, just diplomatically, really, um, between the countries. But it, it's an interesting um, example for me because you see a satellite falling out of space, entering the territory of another country, creating a giant mess, which is which was a nuclear powered satellite. So people actually, so this photo is uh, of individuals looking for radiation, trying to track down where all the, where all the debris landed. Um, and the two countries privately basically negotiating a solution. Another example here uh, is Japan. Um, Japan had put out a tender um, for the purchase of a multifunctional satellite. Uh, number of, countries were competing, uh, the European communities in particular felt uh, that the tender wasn't a, wasn't, uh, design, was designed in a way that favored uh, US industries. And so it launched a, a consultation with the World Trade Organization. Um, so these are the kind of state to state disputes that I've been talking about. The research project that we launched um, sought to assess specifically what commercial parties are doing. Um, we, we couldn't find much, at least formal research on this topic. And so we decided to look more carefully um, at the study of sp space related disputes uh, and commercial entities. Um, and so the research project is at McGill University and it seeks to understand which dispute resolution mechanisms will be most prominent for space related disputes, um, both current and future. Um, we've We've got two different streams to the project, um, but both of the streams currently focus on arbitration. Um, it is the most popular and most widely known dispute resolution mechanism, um, which has its both, and it has pros and cons. But basically the question we're trying to look at is how might arbitration contribute to the resolution of space related disputes. Um, and there um, we've, we've got three preliminary results. These are not um, groundbreaking but they're still important indicators um, in terms of where the current industry is. Uh, the first result just being that the disputes are increasing and prim primarily satellite related disputes. Um, that matches what the space industry currently looks like. And that makes sense. Um, the disputes involve commercial actors as well as um, investors. So non-state and state actors. Um, and then we were also able to to uh, survey industry respondents um, and understand what their dispute resolution needs are. So they are looking for processes that are confidential, that are timely, and that have technical um, expertise throughout the dispute resolution process. Um, but the disputes themselves are not very complicated. So this raises the question of what kinds of disputes we might see in the future. Um, and this is really me setting up the stage, hopefully to talk about these topics further with, with everyone in discussion. Um, but disputes will involve any combination of space actors, um, any combination of issues and facts. Um, as I said, the laws are still, uh, still being determined um, and, and not all space disputes will be very complicated. Some might be, some might not be. Um, and, I've identified at least five areas where I think future disputes will come up. Uh, the first one involves um, satellite related disputes, um, just based on the fact, based on our current research um, and, and knowing that satellite disputes really dominate the industry currently. Uh, future disputes might also involve space debris. Um, so basically man-made objects floating around the earth um, uh, 95% of these man-made objects are just space junk. Um, they're in uh, low Earth orbit. Um, and 
you know, I think disputes will come up, whether they be environmental or commercial, for that matter, um, on these on this issue. Uh, this the space resources is another one. I think it's that's a really interesting one. Um, last year, NASA awarded uh, contracts to four companies uh, to collect space resources and transfer that ownership to NASA itself. And so that's an interesting, I think, prototype for what's to come in the future. Um, Forgive me on this one, just, uh, just so people are thinking along the lines of the wrapper. So first of all, this is just essential information for every citizen of our planet about what, what we are living into in space and the legal framework. From a computational law perspective, um, where we're headed is um, part, I mean, there's relationships to all of these five um, projections of future dispute types. But in particular, as we think about a commodities exchange and other transactions and things like that, this idea of resource allocation and what, ha and you know, you could argue all war of our species has been about resource allocation and, and you know, different opinions about that. But you start getting into questions and, um, wrinkles there um, when it's not just a government um, transfer of some kind, but especially when you have uh, public and private parties or private to private and they, they've got contracts and transactions and all that stuff. Okay, sorry, right back to you. And I should probably say we, we do need to take care to make yeah. sure Bruce can make some remarks yeah. and then we can all talk about what you both said. For sure. So space resources, I, I think it's important, yes, to put an asterisk on it. Um, space flight related accidents, I, I'm sure people have seen a number of different news articles discussing um, Virgin, uh, SpaceX, number of different companies uh, offering um, tourism opportunities for individuals. Um, already people who are private citizens have been to space, um, but this would really mass, um, would speed up that process and will allow a number of other individuals to also go up in, 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 in mass, um, or number of masses to go up, sorry, is what I meant. Space weapons, another interesting, uh, the militarization of space is another interesting field, kind of judging on resources, um, weapons, it's more the, the realpolitik, I guess, um, but it is a very important field as well. So I now have in the next three slides, just three kind of examples of disputes. Um, this is really to, give you a flavor um, of the types of issues and disputes that might come up. Um, and we will, we can talk about this in discussion. Um, the first one, I'll let you take a quick look at the slide. I won't read it out loud. Um, this is another, as I said, example. So please keep in mind what kinds of issues you spot or what kinds of disputes might, might come up from this hypothetical. Similarly, uh, we talked about space resources. Here's another hypothetical. Uh, I'll let you quickly glance through it. Um, party A is a citizen of country A. Party B is a citizen of country B. Both parties are licensed, so they have licenses to perform space resource activities in the same celestial body by country A. They have a dispute over the space resources extracted, as well as who has rights to those resources remaining in situ. And neither party can afford to stop extraction, right? So how can we imagine what are the types of disputes and the issues that the parties will have to um, duke out? Similarly, another example um, on space travel and liability. Um, this one involves public-private partnerships. Again, I'll let you take a quick glance at that um, and then we'll move on. So, I now leave just a stage for the conversation, hopefully, um, for the discussion. Um, in order for, in order to prepare for what's yet to come, I, I believe that we'll have to design dispute resolution processes and regimes that are responsive to the needs of an emerging space industry. The research that we have so far looks at commercial disputes um, that are mostly contractual in nature. Um, we need to have a dispute system design that can ensure effective dispute resolution when disputes do arise. Um, we need to be able to develop, we need to be able to track the development of space law as it, as it plays out and to promote rule of law in outer space. And we need to generate a legal infrastructure we need to design one um, that provides predictability and certainty to space actors in, in all of their different um, kinds. Um, and so with this, I'll just leave you with some proposed building blocks. Um, these are by no means unique. Um, they're derived from the field of conflict of law or private international law. 
uh, but they'll they'll help you think about ideas and places where computational law might be able to assist, um, let's say legislators or like diplomats, negotiators, as well as all the actors who are involved, who have a vested interest in this field and who are still kind of working with, in, in, on grounds that are still currently shifting. So the three kind of general areas are just jurisdiction, applicable law, recognition enforcement. Um, and these raise interesting questions, hopefully for discussion. Uh, which we can marry perhaps with some of the hypotheticals. And with that, I'll end here. Um, thank you so much for uh, your attention. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what, uh, what's to come. You're here. Thank you so much, Viva. That was extraordinary. Um, so now that we have some basis in what's going on in space and what sort of legal frameworks apply and, and some, some of the reality about you know, what's the path for disputes and dispute resolution. Um, uh, Bruce Kahan is going to join us to talk about uh, a very specific proposal for a space commodities exchange and open the question of, um, you know, the potential for computational law capabilities such as smart contracts or other automated um, code base that represents rules, um, contract provisions, possibly integrations for dispute resolution of various types um, uh, as well. Bruce is the Ashoka Fellow for a social investment, uh, social investment entrepreneur and a lecturer at Stanford University. And uh, he's also associated with our friends uh, who we love very much at Codex. Um, so with that, uh, Bruce, uh, do you, uh, are you able to screen share? I guess is the first practical question. Yeah, give me a second. I will uh, screen show that. Perfect. Okay, you're up. You see that, and I'll make it bigger. And and before I do that, I I thought I would um, in the chat put uh, some links. I, I think you may have distributed it to the class, but just in case, these are. Um, ongoing webinars concerning a report that I co-authored with Mir Sadat talking about space policy and finance. And I think uh, uh, for those who are interested, it's, it's good grounding. Um, Aviva, that was amazing. Uh, as a former Wild Gotcha lawyer, uh, again, kudos to you for taking an interest in it. Um, I think for the class, remember the background of what Viva was describing were, were UN treaties born out of the Cold War. Um, and they trace the governing law from whichever state has registered the satellite or other space object. So you end up with a huge conflict of law or choice of law set of questions, which is obviously Viva's uh, specialization in anything in space. Which country am I in on, on the ISS, on the International Space Station? On one side, you're in Russian law, and on the other side, you're in US law. So um, this is a, um, uh, a uh, presentation I gave in October to the OpenGIS uh, Consortium's uh, New Space Workshop in Europe, and, and I thought, you know, given Daz's uh, invitation, it, it would apply. So uh, enough about me. Uh, I do too many things. I teach at Stanford. Um, I have a number of projects, including um, creating this commodities exchange for space. So I do too many things, get over it. I'm fine with it. Um, when we were growing up as kids in the 60s, we, we could imagine, um, uh, you know, not only the trading cards, but actually uh, transacting in space. And, and it was amazing science fiction. Um, and when many of us look up at the night sky, we see the moon this way. Uh, sometimes we don't see the back of it, but um, we do see the uh, front of it. Well, US Geological Survey and others who have been expert at mining uh, the, the earth, see places that would have been in, impacted by uh, asteroids and, and other uh, objects and deposited rare earth or other um, 
minerals that could be mined. So, you know, when you look up, you, you've got to think, golly, that's a huge set of resources that, that Earth could use and Earthlings could use. And so what in the world is a recovering Wall Street lawyer, Hong Kong merchant banker, geospatial technology finance pioneer doing thinking about this stuff? Well, one of the places of conflict I'll suggest is that space is um, a challenge of two primary economic systems that we've developed on earth. One is the centrally planned variety and the other is the hybrid market-based with rule-based economy. And those systems don't necessarily get along nicely on earth and probably will have points of, of uh, uh, intersection uh, up in space. So one of the things that I've been championing is could we use a bit of financial engineering including computational law to grow the space economy. And a prime example, as you'll see, I hope, is this commodities exchange. Making money in space is not easy. And um, you have a lot of risks and you have very low liquidity. You don't make money for a long time. You're investing in assets that, that don't necessarily work, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to get through those um, startup kind of expenses, but they are big expenses. For those who are familiar with VC venture uh, capital, uh, there's obviously a lot of folklore around it, but very few startup companies become unicorns and, and survive five years. So depending on venture-backed money for space, when you've got these assets that are, are going to be critical infrastructure, is not necessarily uh, a viable long-term strategy for government or companies. And, and here it's just um, the, the flow of venture capital. On Earth, we've developed various specializations by region for particular types of goods and services. And we could expect that types of specialization to be repeated in, in space. Um, and there's obviously a competition with uh, rising economic systems like China. Uh, over over the course of years, were you an investor and you were putting together a portfolio of assets uh, to hold, um, uh, you, would, you would vary that uh, asset allocation because no one group of assets would be dominant in a particular year. So you have to have, and, and perhaps this suggests that space could be an asset allocation. Um, Again, with precious metals, no one particular metal, whether it's platinum or gold or silver, dominates year in and year out. So let's go back to the history of commodities exchange. Um, the uh, Chicago Board of Trade is, is probably the, the most um, well-known. But if you go way back, uh, you see that there was a royal exchange in 1571. There was a rice exchange in, China, in Japan in 1710. Um, the Chicago Board of Trade was very much uh, an enabler of the Transcontinental Railroad uh, and what people would put on and receive from the Transcontinental Railroad that moved uh, goods and, and material from uh, the east to, to San Francisco, uh, where I am. And historically, uh, commodities exchange transfers risk. And this is very key to the computational law conversation that we're having. And the modern trading, and, and we can get into blockchain, but, but it, let's leave that to the side as a mechanical um, uh, device for this. Historically, um, an exchange does a couple of things. It standardizes the commodity that you think you are buying or selling. Uh, what, how do you define it? What's the minimum quality and quantity of it? it? It standardizes the contract terms. You know, uh, What am I expected 
to pay? Uh, when do I get delivery? It, what are my rates of recourse? And then it actually creates a secondary asset, meaning the commodity contract is now an asset that can be traded, uh, separate and apart from the commodity itself. Um, so these are the things that exchanges have done over the, the last 300 years. Um, and it's a very essential function in the uh, economy. We don't really see it that often, but it, but it has tremendous benefits in, in making uh, uh, transactions fast and dependable in the commodity market. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of what happens when that's not so reliable with the game stop uh, nonsense going on this week. Um, and, and there are modern dashboards for uh, for traders to to track because in in effect you want to know well what's the demand for a given commodity as related to a secondary commodity that it's used with or, or a secondary product that it produces. And knowing where supply and demand meet for space assets is intensely valuable. So you don't over or under invest in one and lack the other. Um, in doing the research, uh, the, the revenue of an exchange seems to come more from the data and the value of knowing that supply demand relationship than the actual transaction fees for putting the contract together and, and uh, uh, settling it. This is just showing you how variable uh, commodities prices can be. Um, and and uh, again, the com comparative returns based on the different types of commodity indexes. Space, as Viva was saying, is growing, which is fantastic but it's not growing um, predictably. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and that's a problem because you, you do need with long-term assets that you're gonna build for space, such as ground stations for satellites, you need some predictability so that you're not left uh, holding uh, a, a dysfunctional asset. Um, Universities like each of ours, uh, Stanford and, and MIT have endowments that they uh, invest and, and clearly uh, they might wanna have some exposure to the space industry. Um, I've identified five buckets of commodities that could trade on a space commodities exchange. So I'll go through them really quickly. Um, raw materials, um, Viva hinted at this with the resources, you know, if I could find um, lunar rock with water or ice. I can make water out of it. I can make processed goods. I can make oxygen, uh, hydrogen uh, for fuel. Uh, third bucket would be services. We have a lot of those. We have launch and bandwidth and debris removal coming, coming online. Um, financial derivatives. Uh, you wouldn't think of a financial derivative as a commodity contract, but it actually is. So Daz and I can, can bet on the movement of the um, uh, interest rates. He can take one side of the bet, I can take the other. Those swaps are very similar to what you could issue for does the launch happen or not. And the effect of, of creating those swaps or other derivatives is to relieve the pressure on the equity raised by a space company that they're holding all that risk. They can externalize and, and push that risk out into the market to people who enjoy buying risk and don't understand space. And then the fifth bucket are financial indexes. If we decide we wanna have a slice of our portfolio, our retirement funds that are invested in the index for lunar commodities, uh, we can buy an index on that. So those are the five commodities. And then this is kind of the most fun I've had um, with the exchange project is naming the trading symbols for the commodities. So here you see a bit of that and how Bruce has fun with that. Um, so launch from earth to low earth or orbit of inanimate cargo by kilogram, uh, et cetera. Um, one of the things that this solves for potentially for the, the government, whether it's the US government or 
other allied nations is typically defense budgets don't get passed on time, which means that the whole supply chain that's depending on those appropriations is in doubt. Well, being able to buy a commodity uh, at the end of the, of, of the procurement path uh, would, would tell people, no, 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 you're gonna get paid for that commodity. This is a very elegant but oversimplified wall chart of the defense federal acquisitions process many hundreds of steps and and whether you get through it is not simple or predictable as compared to there are 23 core principles that the commodity futures trading commission the cftc that regulates exchanges uses to assure that the rules that are built for the exchange to operate actually end up producing commodities um, that uh, that are delivered. So there's a much simpler and, and the two processes, you know, in terms of our, our focus on computational law, this is not easy. This is easy, right? Um, so how would you onboard commodities? We've thought about that. Um, and I've created an acronym called a CRL, a commoditization readiness level. So some of you certainly at MIT would have been exposed to TRLs, technology readiness levels that go from zero to nine. Um, is it just a, a technology that works in the lab or can you produce it at scale? And MRL, can you manufacture it? You know, you've got it in the lab, but actually can you do it and, and deploy it? IRL and investor readiness level. Um, and, and then the interactions of those RLs produce a commoditization readiness level. And the reason I needed a, a CRL was I need to know how to define the commodity for sale before it's produced so it can be traded. Um, so this is a little bit of how those interrelate. And I know I'm running short on time, so I'm going fast. Um, and then just for those who would ask how you're gonna you know, organize this, um, there's obviously a spectrum for public private uh, ownership of, of uh, entities like an exchange. And um, because we're going really fast, um, my, my thought is that we will have the expertise to define each of the five buckets, but that the ownership structure of this exchange, which has to last, decades would be um, primarily in a trust with some uh, private ownership and member ownership. The, the key piece of this, I think, that interrelates to, to the topic that we've had is, uh, first, we need the financial engineering for space, not just the technical. Second, we, we, the rule book that the exchange writes for itself and its members to, to agree to, very much comes back to Viva's point, which is let's make people who can agree on how to handle their rights, uh, have a forum in which to do so, and then to transact based on that. So the rule book, which I, I've not emphasized in this presentation is incredibly important. And it qualifies who can be a member of the exchange and, and whether you trust them to buy and sell. And that gets into some international relations and, and conflict ish, avoidance issues. So anyway, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and um, open it up for questions. And, and I know we, we stop at the top of the hour. So um, I hope that was, that was okay. That was amazing. Uh, the chat has been, um, has really been uh, um, very active and we've got a back chat. In fact, I'm so enthused by your remarks, I've decided just to take a trip to Mars for a moment um, and get in the spirit of the discussion to come. And in that spirit, we want to say that anyone that needs to leave at 1 p.m. Eastern, understood. Um, however, we have had some back talk um, and many of us uh, that are offering the class are able to stay another 10 minutes. And I wanna ask, so I'd like to invite those that would like to continue the discussion to stay 10 more minutes. Um, and let me just ask right now, 
uh, Viva and or Bruce, can one or both of you remain 10 minutes? Um, no pressure. Honestly, I can't. I have to get on with Apple at, at the top of the hour. So, you bet. but um, people, uh, let me put my um, email in, in the chat so folks can feel free to, to email anytime. Yeah. Great. So the first question that we have, oh, I'm sorry, Tammy, would you like to pose the questions, please? I don't. Let's start with one from Sue since you have to leave. Um, so, I, I can get us started. Uh, Br Brian Ulysses asks, um, <clears throat> um, "What resources are there for doing due diligence research on satellites?" And I might expand that for extra credit to you know other space-based resources. So. I think the due diligence is, is a couple fold. First, um, given the international nature of space and given the sensitivity for national security, which you'll certainly read about in the report that I posted for you all, um, we need to know where every part and every piece of software came from. Uh, that's an essential piece of business and it shouldn't be left for uh, the end of the story. It needs to be embedded. Second, um, with the commodities exchange, you get an enormous amount of data validation for the commodity complying with the definition of its um, type. And so one way to organize the diligence for purposes of trading is to have a registry of who can trade and what they can trade and, and to let the experts in, let's say that lunar water or the debris removal define the technologies and proofs that, that need to be, excuse me, embedded before the commodity can be offered for, for sale. So, so that would standardize uh, not only the diligence, but as importantly, if the interoperability of one commodity with a second. You know, I mean, the worst thing that would be is you get a USB A plug and a USB C recharger in space, and they don't, they can't fit together. Um, I can't get Vasa back from Mars that way, or Matt Damon uh, next to him. So I need to make sure that there's uh, not only um, legal interoperability. Uh, but there needs to be uh, practical, technical interoperability. Here, here. Yeah, interoperability always is a question, not just of technology, but there's business and process interoperability. There's legal interoperability, in fact. Yeah, for some of this. yeah. So Viva, we wanted to pose the same question uh, to you. Uh, did, did you have any thoughts about due diligence? Or I know when we were prepping for the lecture, we were thinking about almost like legal frameworks as preventative law before we get to disputes, what can we learn up front to maybe structure things and is due diligence part of that or what do you think um yeah no I, so firstly i would just uh, this is more um i see some comments on on registries and i would just say that the there is a registration convention and every object that goes into outer space is supposed to be registered it's not always followed um, and I can um, I can share the link for that, and you can actually it's really fun. You can you can look up literally everything or a lot of things. Sorry, they're not all of them um, that have been launched. And I think that's that kind of shows what the drafters of these conventions were thinking about before, especially during the Cold War. But even now, I think it's 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 an important way to give notification and for actors to know um, what is going to go to outer space. And I think that could probably be the start of other due diligence, um, you know, when we talk about interoperability, how can, how can commodities, how can something that's going, let's say there's a probe, right, um, that's being put up on X asteroid, um, that has to be launched from somewhere, it has to be launched from Earth, usually, <laughs> initially, at least, it has to be launched from Earth, uh, you know, after that, perhaps there's something in outer space that can serve as a launching pad for other, other locations, but um, how can we monitor what goes up um, and what comes down is something that the drafters have thought about, uh, which shouldn't be, which I think is worth underscoring. In terms of future, I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see 
Uh, I agree with I agree with Bruce. I mean, interoperability will be one of those things. Uh, I think some standardization may come from contracts themselves. Um, you know, it might be that, for example, a space exchange, right, a, a, a future space exchange has certain rules that all traders have to follow, including uh, a, a clause that is a uh, standardized clause um, that just in order to participate on the exchange, you have to you have to do, and, and that helps with the due diligence. Um, but a lot of interoperability issues will have to kind of navigate how states have been operating and how these new space actors, um, how they are going to be playing a role um, in this new, new, new economy. Um, and I don't quite know how that will pan out. I think it'll be, it'll be interesting. Sorry. I'm also getting distracted by the comments. <laughs> they are terrific. And so just to help us organize everything, we're going to uh, rely on TMA to be the spokesperson of the peoples. Thanks, Daza. Um, Bruce, I don't know if it's time for a very quick last question, but um, Antonio asked whether or not uh, Russia, sh like you see Russia as being part of the space economy and what the legal treatment for Russia should be. I think you have to ask the State Department um, to, to be to be really pithy here. Um, I, I the exchange itself would have some rules, and and there will be nation states that cannot or will choose not to meet those rules, uh, particularly around transparency and around uh, accountability. So, um, I'm not the UN. The UN is the UN. Um, there are space treaties the UN has written that have not been adopted by certain states. And that kind of speaks for itself in terms of what to do with certain states who, who choose to, to go it alone. You know. So folks, I apologize. Thank you so much for letting me participate in the, in the class. I've got to bounce, but I'm open to any questions and Daza knows where I live uh, on Earth so far. Okay. Great. Thank Bye, you guys. so much. Thank you, Bye, so everybody. Much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. And and I'm also going to have to jump off. So just thank thanks to everybody for participating and email me if you have any questions about projects and looking forward to seeing what we can put together with all of them. Thanks, Brian. So maybe we can ask we have a, one more question and then we can wrap it up for today. So. Um, Anya asked, uh, I'm going to broaden Anya's question a little bit. So <laughs> thank you, Anya, for letting me take, uh, Anja, for letting me take uh, liberties with your question. But would you presume that any computational contract or rules in addition to digi distributed ledger technologies like blockchain um, would be more appropriate for commoditization of space? And if so, would an exchange tradable fund be a potential financial instrument to start with? <laughs> um, I mean, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in this field. Um, I think, I think, I think computational law offers an opportunity um, to not make the mistakes of the past. Um, and it offers an opportunity to think outside the box. So to the extent that we can focus on um, issues that come up that are repeated issues to the extent these are technical issues, I think computational law can help with that. And the idea of the hypotheticals was to give people a chance to think about what kinds of disputes or issues are technical um, that can be automated, that can be um, crowdsourced, that can be um, uh, standardized really. Um, and what kinds of issues will require secondary, tertiary um, forms of thinking about them, uh, which overlap with, and we've already touched on it, right? Um, political issues, military issues. Um, we haven't even got, I mean, there's environmental issues. So not every, I mean, you, for, for the commodities exchange, right? I, I think it's also really important to think about the big picture and, and not just think of resources um, that will be traded um, in the future, but also learn from the lessons of how the trade of resources has um, raised legal and ethical issues for 
nations that have been left out of the conversation. Um, and so, it re right, I think talking about specifically about contracts and, and, and ways to simplify those, I think we should absolutely do it. Um, but I think we should also think about, uh, you know, there are limits to computational law. Um, at some point, certain things cannot only be passed on to automation. Um, some things will require uh, cooperation um, and standardization. And then the question is, how do we do that? And how do we agree to what the rules of the games are gonna, what, what, what will be the rules to the game? Um, and that's where everything in many ways breaks down. And I appreciate the question on Russia as well. Um, you know, countries may, do their own thing and that's what Russia does and has done and America will do its thing and then you have parallel systems and in fact you do have plugs <laughs> that look differently and you have to bring a thing with you at all times so I think my, my answer is I know it's a bit broader um, than what's asked but I, I think it's really important to focus on what are technical issues that computational law that smart contracts that automation that blockchain can help with and what are the issues that will require bigger, um, uh, will require perhaps more thinking, more cooperation. Um, and what will the standardization bodies be? Um, so this is an open question um, that I think is still being negotiated. So, so um, uh, I will stop looking at the, at the chat, but I'll end there. Um, Daz, it looks like you've got- I, I did, if I may please, just- Please just join in. Thing. Thanks, just to, um, I hope, you know, catalyze thinking from uh, any of the students that are in the class now, it, any of the speakers in the class, or any of the people out in the land of the internet that may be hearing this later, you know, they, they're probably, imagine that there may be some phases, like we may have kind of state, we may stage and phase uh, the eventual adaption and adoption of general standards and formal standards. Um, in between now when there's a lot of bilateral things and maybe a few little multilateral things with the commercial space and everything and then that you know kind of globalish standardization there may are there opportunities that you could imagine uh where alliances or federations or other um ongoing repeatable continuous multilateral maybe contract and and uh, and uh, other legal framework based voluntary systems could begin to find what the best practices are, which may be right for codification as a standard. And what could that look like? And what would your job description be in that? And who could hire you? Or how can you get that funded? And how do we build it? Anyway, those are some questions I would love to tantalize you all with. I love that. I, I actually um, had a thought to just one quick thought. I feel like what you said, Viva, about how there are certain technical issues, but then also these like cooperation and human thinking issues that we are, we're going to have to eventually resolve makes me feel like they, these new, there may have to, there may be new legal frameworks that we're going to have to think up that are better suited for codification of these rules. And perhaps what we already have, it's kind of like the point about the economy, right? Like we, don't, we might not have an economic system that is currently suitable for space. But thinking about these questions will eventually like reveal possibilities that we just haven't thought of yet. So anyway, um, do you guys have any more thoughts before we close up? I think I, I would just I would just add, I think it's really important to think about the system that we would like um, and learn from the past. And I think this is why I mentioned how might we design, how might we use, I see computational law as a tool. There are also other tools that are out there um, and how might we, design a new system. And of course it will be a competition for the best idea. Um, standardization bodies will adopt what works and what has been adopted. Um, and so in a way, we all have an opportunity to think about these bigger questions and propose solutions that hopefully can, can be part of the answer going forward. Maybe not this year, but definitely the next few decades where we see the economy growing. Um, there is opportunity. There's a lot of good that's come from space. Um, so these are just big picture questions that I hope to leave with you. Um, thank you for the invitation, Daza. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I really like this class. I, 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 you know, it's really nice to be talking to some of you and, and, and learning about um, things that people are interested in as well. You're here. Well, we all want to thank you so much as well for putting together that 
um, that kind of grounding presentation and being such a good sport to just co-think with us uh, some of the implications and, and new directions. And uh, just to be absolutely clear, we do this every year. You're always welcome here, my fellow legal hacker. <laughs> Good. And so with that, uh, it is that time now. Uh, We're going to wrap up the class and that is also wrapping up the last live session for the 2021 edition of the MIT IAP computational law course. And so on behalf of the team and on behalf of MIT, I want to thank you all from all around the world um, who've uh, come and brought your A game and made and helped co-create with us uh, what the course has become. And uh, we will be following up as we always do with an email um, wrapping up and providing the links and the uh, slide decks and even the video so you can relive the great times and moments of this class into the future and share it out. And uh, with more information uh, for those of you that are going to be submitting your class projects along the lines of what Brian said. And last but not least, while this is an end, it's only the end of the beginning. So an invitation to our last Friday of the month 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time computational law community building call. And we hope that uh, you will join us for that. If you're a participant in this class in any role or capacity, you are invited. So with that, thanks again, everybody. And we hope that you enjoyed this class as much as we did. Bye-bye. <laughs>